Today, we will discuss uh, in this lecture uh, various ways the piston engine supplies power to a aircraft propulsion unit. Uh, as we have been discussing in the last one or two lectures, uh, piston engine has been used as a power supplier uh, for aircraft uh, engines for last more than 100 years. And uh, we have been discussing various basis of these uh, piston engines or IC engines as they are often called uh, and how uh, they have been configured based on certain thermodynamic principles, certain thermodynamic cycles and we had had a look at some of these thermodynamic cycles which actually govern the fundamental uh, concept behind functioning of these engines. Today, we will look at some of the mechanical aspects of how these engines actually work and how they actually create uh, power and how these power is finally harnessed for flying of the aircraft. So, uh, this is the uh, basic uh, principles under which uh, the piston engine works and that is what we will discuss in this uh, particular uh, lecture. Uh, and the mechanical theories, we have we had looked at the various um, thermodynamic cycles and the thermodynamic theories, the cycle theories, how they uh, work, uh, the ideal cycles, the real cycles. Today, we will try to look at uh, the theory of the mechanical engineering that makes these engines work and exactly how do you go about designing them, how you go about predicting their performance or calculating their performance and we need to do that to make sure that the engine is working ok. If you look at uh, an engine and if you uh, the first thing that you would see is the power is created within a uh, restricted volume which we call a cylinder. Now, within this cylinder everything that you have seen in a thermodynamic cycle happens. Uh, so, thermodynamic cycle is basically uh, is the matrix on which uh, this uh, piston and cylinder combination functions. So, inside the cylinder you have a piston and as the movement of the piston allows certain amount of air which we often call charge that comes in and then the fuel is burnt and what is created is a, a gas which is a mixture of air and burnt fuel. And when this hot gas uh, starts uh, operating, the cylinder moves and that is how the movement of the piston is uh, created inside the cylinder and this uh, creates the power or work and that is what we are mostly interested in. Uh, the fact that we burn fuel the fact that the burning of the fuel creates uh, hot gas uh, is the reason for which these engines are all called heat engines. So, basically uh, what we are looking at is of course, an heat engine and it is also referred to as an internal combustion engine, IC engine as popularly known as and this internal combustion obviously refers to the fact that we have the combustion or heating inside a restricted uh, identified uh, space and this space is the cylinder uh, and the piston and the volume contained within the piston and the cylinder and this is the space within which the heating is first done and then we see the mechanism by which this heat is converted to work. So, conversion of heat to work is what we are uh, actually dealing with at this moment and that is why this is called uh, generally in a very generic manner a heat engine. Now, what we see here is a piston which is enclosed within a cylinder and then as the ignition occurs the fuel air mixture is burnt and a high pressure is created somewhere at the uh, top of the cylinder over here and that high pressure then activates the piston. So, this movement of the piston is created by the hot gas okay, and that creates what we have already called power stroke. So, it moves the uh, cylinder from the uh, top of this uh, station to the bottom over here which we have called the top dead center and the bottom dead center 
when once they reach this top and the bottom, they start their the piston starts their journey uh, backward. That means from the bottom it starts moving to the top, and when it reaches the top, after the ignition and the heating, it starts moving to the bottom. So that's a movement of the piston. It's moved from uh, bottom to top and top to bottom, and it keeps doing that all the time, and during which we have the execution of the thermodynamic uh, processes which are contained within the thermodynamic cycle which were presented in the last lecture. So, that is the mechanism by which uh, basically the whole thing works. Okay. Now, you see the movement of the piston uh, is uh, created from the top dead center and as we know when it moves from the top to the bottom we call it a power stroke. Now, as we know by now that only one leg or one process within the whole thermodynamic cycle actually is a power creating or work creating process. Rest of the processes within that thermodynamic cycle are not power creating uh, processes. So, same thing here uh, uh, typically these uh, ice engines have uh, you know four uh, strokes and these are often called four stroke engines and only one of the stroke is power creating. Now, how does the motion of the piston uh, get sustained over other three strokes and this, this is normally done through what is known as a flywheel, which is in case of aircraft engines a combination of the crankshaft, the propeller and rest of the things, which means when once the power stroke is delivered and the power is delivered, this entire uh, uh, flywheel uh, motion that is the propeller and crankshaft starts moving. Uh, that means, their rotary motion is initiated. Now, once the rotary motion is initiated, that motion is sustained by itself okay, for another three strokes. So, other three strokes are created by the uh, continuous motion of these uh, which we may now call flywheel for the time being let us say and as the flywheel moves the other three strokes are sustained till the next power stroke comes. So, out of the four strokes one stroke is a power stroke other three are sustained by the uh, flywheel. Uh, so, that till the next power stroke comes the motion of the entire engine motion of the pistons the motion of the shafts are sustained this is important. If you do not do that, obviously, the engine is going to come to a halt. Once uh, uh, the power stroke is over, as we know, the next thing that needs to be done is the gases need to be exhausted. That means, the gases which are burned, uh, pressure were created and now the power stroke is over, which means the work that we wanted to get out of this uh, high energy gas has been taken out and now actually we do not have any need for this gas anymore. So, we need to get rid of this gas and this is done by what is known as the exhaust stroke. In this exhaust stroke, this piston now starts moving upward okay? and as it starts moving upward, the gas which uh, contain the entire cylinder gets uh, exhausted through one of the exhaust valves and as a result of which the used up gas is now sent out of the cylinder. Cylinder is our working space and it is now sent out of the working space and as a result of which uh, this once the cylinder is more or less exhausted, fresh charge or fresh air or fuel air mixture can now come in through the uh, inlet valve and fill up the uh, cylinder space all over again for the next four strokes. Okay, that means, the next cycle through which the work is performed. So, this is how the work is uh, actually sustained from uh, one uh, cycle of four strokes to next cycle of four strokes. The linear motion of the piston, and this is a bit of mechanical engineering which we need to know, is sustained through the connecting rod and is transferred to the crankshaft. And, and the crankshaft, you see what we have here is a linear motion of the piston. <clears throat> it is just moving up and down, up and down or if it is positioned horizontally, it would be moving sideways. So, what we have here essentially is a linear motion. The work is being done simply in the form of a linear motion 
and this linear motion now needs to be converted to a rotary motion and that is done through this crankshaft and as a result of which the crankshaft that supplies power to the propeller in case of a uh, aircraft engine and that is how the propeller rotates and creates thrust. So, we need to convert linear motion of the piston to a rotary motion and that is done through the system of connecting rods and uh, cams and crankshaft. And then we have the concept of flywheel, which then sustains the motion or continued smooth motion through the other strokes, so that we have continuous motion. Now, when you have multiple cylinders, as we have seen that many of the aircraft engines actually have uh, more than one cylinder, quite often up to 10, 12 or even 16, 18 cylinders. And what happens is the supply of power to the uh, central crankshaft, uh, every engine has only one single crankshaft and all the cylinders supply power to that crankshaft and as a result of which now that the cylinder power strokes are time staggered, the supply of power to the crankshaft is now time staggered as a result of which when one particular cylinder is executing some other stroke, let us say exhaust stroke or, a, a, or a intake stroke, the some other cylinder is prob probably providing the power stroke. So, as a result of which continuous power is being supplied to the crankshaft and the whole uh, flywheel or the uh, crankshaft propeller combined continues to rotate all the time, because some cylinder or the other almost on a continuous basis is supplying power to the main crankshaft. And this is how it typically in an aircraft engine, a multi cylinder arrangement uh, continues to uh, supply power to the main crankshaft. Now, it means that when you have more number of cylinders, uh, there are certain mechanical advantages and today we are discussing some of the mechanical issues involved with the engine. It actually creates a little more vibration free or smooth operation. Now, this is very important in a actual operation of an engine. If you, if you can create an engine that is vibration free, because what happens is as we have seen, you have four strokes, one of them is a power stroke and during the other strokes, the engine has to sustain itself in its motion and as a result of which it is possible that there is a uneven uh, application of force or moment uh, on the crankshaft. Now, this uneven uh, application of force and moment on the engine can create certain amount of vibration. If you have more engine, more cylinders, uh, 6 or 8 or 10 or you know even 12 or as we have seen up to 18 cylinders is possible. If you put them together and sometime or the other, every split second if, uh, one of the cylinders is supplying power to the crankshaft, then that particular engine is likely to be more vibration free. It is likely to be more smooth because the can crankshaft is almost getting supply power almost on a continuous basis. So, a multi cylinder uh, arrangement quite often comes out to be a smoother operating engine compared to let us say a single or a two cylinder engine. So, the aggregate power of a reciprocating engine is then uh, normally given in terms of the total volume of all the pistons together. Uh, that means, the displaced volume, the amount of volume that is typically created between the top dead center and the bottom dead center. This motion is what the piston is executing every time it moves from one end to another and this is what we call the displaced volume and this is the volume of displacement of the gas and this is the volume which is often quoted as a capacity of the engine and this all the cylinders together you can quote a certain total amount of volume and that is often specified as the uh, engine specification and is representative of the engine's capacity to produce power. So, total volume of all the pistons together is often quoted as the engine's capacity and is indicative of the engine's capacity to produce power. 
Now, let us see actually how the engine uh, a particular cylinder actually creates power. We can put now numbers or simple relations uh, to some of the concept that we have been talking about. You have a piston which uh, we say that it has a, a piston stroke of length L p and it moves as we see from B d c to T d c and then of course, back from D d uh, T d c to B d c. Now, when the piston is at T d c from the cycle we have seen it reaches a pressure of P 4 from the cycle diagram we have seen that and this pressure then is very high. It is also hot gas of course. So, and as a result of which it executes a lot of force on this uh, head, head, head of the piston or often is called piston head and this has an area. So, obviously, more this area of the piston head more is likely to be the force, but as we have seen the aircraft engine has to have certain limitation of its size and weight and as a result the size and weight are often a little restricted. So, the pressure here created creates the force which then starts driving the piston to its power stroke. That means, its motion backwards from T d c back from T d c to B d c and it executes the power stroke. Now, the power delivered to the engine by one cylinder is often given by this uh, simple relation uh, which is power is equal to P effective into the power stroke into the area of the uh, piston uh, into n by 2, n by 2 being the power strokes per minute where n is actually the rpm or the motion of the rotary motion of the crankshaft. So, it, it tells us very quickly that if it is rotating, if we are managed to managing to rotate the crankshaft at high speed, uh, you know we are able to get more power or vice versa whichever way you look at it and as it is obvious that if you have more area of the piston, then you get more power. You have a longer piston length, uh, which is uh, the force into distance and that is your work done from your uh, Newton's laws of motion and as a result of which you get uh, the power done. Now, P effective is something which we are yet to uh, define actually and, and mind you P effective is not same as P 4. So, P effective is some kind of an average power that is average pressure that is applied on the head of the piston during its power stroke. So, we will define that a little more formally in a couple of minutes. So, just at this moment remember P effective is not same as P 4 which is the maximum pressure that the piston or the cylinder actually uh, experiences. So, uh, the number of cylinders if it is given by capital N C, the total amount of engine power that one can say is created is given in terms of uh, as we know in terms of I H P which we call indicated horsepower okay? and nowadays of course, they are all mentioned in terms of kilowatts and the N C comes in as the last parameter and hence you get the indicated horsepower or what we can call a mechanical uh, uh, estimation of the ideal horsepower. The total volume displaced which we were talking about just a while earlier is now given in terms of uh, area of the piston head, the length of the stroke into the number of cylinders. Okay? That is the volume which I was talk talking about and that is the total displaced volume which is often quoted as the engine capacity. You might uh, hear same things about the various automobile engines where the total displaced volume is quoted as the engine capacity. And hence, we can write now IHP in terms of effective power, the total displaced volume into the power stroke per minute which is n by 2. So, that gives us an idea about the mechanical estimation of the indicated horsepower. As we know, we have earlier defined indicated horsepower from the cycle diagram, thermodynamic cycle diagram. Okay, now, we can see that we can have an estimation of that uh, from purely from uh, the uh, piston and cylinder configuration point of view. Okay. Now, some of the power that is developed in the piston cylinder is actually lost in friction of the piston 
and the inner surface of the cylinder. Now, this is often referred to as frictional horsepower and this is a continuous affair. This is going on during all the strokes of the piston. Mind you, one of the strokes is only power stroke, others are not power stroke and even during the other strokes, this friction is continuously happening and as a result of which a lot of power is actually lost in the process of overcoming the frictional uh, friction between the piston and the inner surface of the cylinder and this needs to be this is not a small amount this is a reasonably good amount and this needs to be factored into the actual power availability of the engine so actual power available at the end of the uh, shaft may then be called the brake horsepower or bhp and this is of course ihp minus fhp which we call the frictional horsepower now the bhp can be written in terms of uh, twice pi into rpm into the torque that is produced we shall see as we go along that the torque produced by the engine is of great importance in running the propeller the propeller has a certain torque characteristics and we shall discuss that later on in this course that unless you meet those torque characteristics the thrust would not be created so the torque of uh, created by the engine needs to match with that of the propeller and as and we know from simple mechanical formulations that the horsepower or the bhp can be actually written down in terms of torque now this torque of course can be also written down, the bhp can also be written down in terms of uh, ihp into the mechanical efficiency of transmission of the crankshaft and that again uh, into the various uh, uh, parameters here the p effective the total volume the rpm and as a result of which we get a parameter which we call p effective brake now this is what we had uh, mentioned earlier as uh, p effective and now we call this brake mean effective pressure b m e p uh, actually speaking if you measure it this whole thing with reference to ihp you can actually come up with uh, something which is uh, indicated mean effective pressure i m e p it's possible uh, but that will be an ideal mean effective pressure the more uh, useful uh, mean effective pressure is the brake mean effective pressure which is related to the final bhp that is being created and uh, through the piston cylinder arrangement and this is uh, why i said that this is some kind of an average pressure that is actually uh, created by the theoreticians uh, it's not something that you can measure actually and it is not the physically active pressure which is active inside the cylinder so it's a kind of measure of the average mean gas load through which the piston actually operates and it has become a widely used index of the engine performance uh, as a result of which uh, we need to keep an eye on this brake mean effective pressure uh, for uh, our various understanding of how the piston cylinder arrangement actually works. Okay. Uh, since the entire objective of an aircraft engine, uh, the IC engine or the piston engine that we are looking at is fundamentally to convert the chemical energy contained within the fuel into finally propulsive thrust. So, what we have first to begin with the input to the engine is the fuel which has chemical energy contained within it. Once it is burnt, this energy manifests in the form of heat and then the heat is converted to the piston motion, linear motion which is converted to the rotary motion. That rotary motion is, is transmitted through the crankshaft to the propeller and which then creates the propulsive thrusts. So, it is a fairly uh, long drawn out procedure through which finally thrust is created. So, uh, we have quite a few steps to uh, contend with before we get the thrust uh, and thrust is what makes the aircraft fly. So, the overall efficiency of this entire process 
uh, needs to be also understood and estimated for us to know what is the energy efficiency of this entire power plant. So, we have an engine which is fed with uh, a mass flow let us say uh, m dot f and which let us say has a thermal uh, input of uh, q f and this mass flow has a thermal input of q f and B H P is normally as I mentioned expressed nowadays in terms of kilowatts and uh, it may also be expressed in terms of kilojoules per hour and where Q f is the heating value of the fuel. This is a characteristic of the fuel. This is the chemical energy that is expected to be contained with the, within the fuel. It will vary from one fuel to another quite often quite substantially and hence you need to choose your fuel very carefully. Uh, you need to choose a fuel that has a good heating value and quite often many other characteristics of the fuel are also uh, taken care of in choosing the fuel, but one of the main things or probably the first thing that makes for the choice of the fuel is the heating value of the fuel. You want to have a lot of heat generated by burning the fuel and as I said the fuel is characterized by the heating value it is it's a typical chemical energy con content of the fuel that comes out through the heating value. The ratio of these two quantities that means the chemical energy that we have we can expect to be available in the form of heat and the final power that is created in terms of BHP the ratio of the two is the brake efficiency of the engine and this is our brake thermal efficiency of the engine which is the most important efficiency parameter uh, that actually is quoted as efficiency of the engine. This can be written in terms of uh, m dot uh, 1 by m dot f by b h p into q okay? and uh, m dot f by b h p of course, is the uh, parameter which is of importance and uh, this is often referred to as brake specific fuel consumption and this is given in terms of uh, m dot f by b h p and is often expressed in terms of kgs per kilowatt hour. Now, brake specific fuel consumption is conceptually based on uh, the b h p where you can again uh, you know conceptually you can have a indicated uh, specific fuel consumption where instead of b h p you can use i h p and you can get that but as I mentioned the more useful one is the brake specific fuel consumption. So, when we say B S F C we are talking about uh, the utility of the fuel in terms of the brake horsepower the final horsepower that is available from the engine. Now, in most of the modern uh, uh, engines uh, B S F C is quoted as the uh, figure of engine efficiency or figure of merit for the engine efficiency. Uh, we have just defined the engine efficiency or brake thermal efficiency, but most engineers would like to prefer uh, to use uh, B S F C as a measure of the engine efficiency. So, quite often in the engine specifications you may not find the value of engine efficiency actually mentioned anywhere. Uh, it's it's more of a theoretical understanding uh, by the designers, but the engineers and operators quite often would use BSFC as the measure of the engine efficiency. And now we can also look at the overall efficiency of the uh, piston uh, and propeller combined, and this is often given in terms of the overall efficiency, uh, which is equal to the brake thermal efficiency into eta p which is the propeller efficiency okay? and uh, quite often the propeller efficiency comes out of the propeller understanding which we will probably do uh, you know later on in this uh, course. So, um, typically when an aircraft is flying at cruise condition the brake thermal efficiency is likely to be of the order of 30 percent whereas, the propeller efficiency the aerodynamic efficiency of the propeller functioning it could be of the order of 85 percent and in which case the overall engine uh, thrust producing efficiency could be of the order of 25.5 percent. 
Now, that is the kind of overall thrust production efficiency with which the aircraft power plant functions. A, a word about the fuel. Some of the fuels that are used in uh, typical aircraft engines are basically the petrol based. Uh, in some parts of the world, they are also called gasoline. Now, they have as I mentioned a very high heating value that is how they are chosen and quite often they are uh, to be used under high compression ratios. We need to have high power output and of course, as we have just seen the efficiency uh, definition, uh, good efficiency at various operating conditions of the aircraft and most specifically at high altitudes where uh, the aircraft actually flies. Now, this kind of fuel is typified by what is known as uh, high octane value uh, and octane rating is given in terms of uh, in terms of 100 and the aircraft fuels are often of 100 octane and they often have what is known as a small amount of lead content. This is this lead is uh, uh, tetraethyl lead which is often added to a basic fuel It's blended with the basic fuel which is often as I mentioned uh, some variety of uh, petrol and pro provides a high octane rating. And now, uh, we know that in the land based automobiles, this addition of tetraethyl is now banned because of the environmental issues, but in aircraft engine, quite it is still being practiced because aircraft mostly flies at very high altitudes and as a result of which, we require the high octane rating that is uh, necessary to operate at very high compression ratios at high speeds uh, for producing high power at reasonably good efficiencies. We now see that quite often an aircraft engine has to operate at high altitudes where it has to produce good power at good efficiency and for power production at high altitudes we have a few issues. Now, if we go back to the cycle diagram, which we are familiar with, we shall see that the you know the exhaust that starts at the point 5, uh, well while the cylinder pressure is you know uh, still quite high actually, uh, high above the atmosphere. Now, you realize the aircraft has gone to high altitude. So, the atmospheric pressure is rather low. So, the exhaust stroke uh, which ends at near atmospheric, which as I mentioned uh, by virtue of the inertia of the piston motion uh, happens at a, a lower pressure. So, the difference between the exhaust pressure and the intake pressure starts going up and as a result of which this loop which we see here the intake exhaust loop uh, starts consuming more and more this area becomes higher and higher. Uh, which is the non productive or non power creating uh, uh, loop of the cycle and as a result of which uh, a lot of power that is produced actually goes into this loop and uh, it is not available at the end as BHP. Now, this is a problem uh, and as a result of which the available BHP would go down. Now, one of the ways of getting around this is by what is generally known as augmentation procedure and in this an attempt is made to raise this intake pressure to a higher level through a process which is known as supercharging and a device that is called supercharger which raises the intake pressure to a higher value. So, that this intake exhaust loop again becomes a small one and does not take away a lot of power and as a result of which the BHP available would again become a reasonable value for uh, supplying power to the propeller. So, this supercharging is a business which we will look into in some detail in the next class and for the moment just remember that for aircraft engines you need to have this augmentation which is normally not required in land based automobiles, but in aircraft without this augmentation procedure or without the supercharger the aircraft uh, would not be able to get sufficient power supply from the engine for e executing its flight motions. Now, uh, when the uh, cylinder is operational, 
we have just seen that at the end of the exhaust stroke, the burnt gases are exhausted from the cylinder. However, we have just we also know that at the end of the uh, stroke, when the uh, piston reaches the top dead center, there is a certain amount of volume which is still containing the burnt gases. So, all the burnt gases do not go out of the cylinder, a very small amount remains and when the intake valve opens and the fresh charge or fresh air comes in, it gets mixed with the fresh air and as a result of which, what you get uh, finally, is a combination of fresh air charge and uh, a certain amount of residual burnt gases that has remained after the exhaust stroke. And as a result of which, effectively the piston capacity of the, uh, the volume uh, with which you have been talking about effectively gets reduced. This error is attempted to be now quantified through a term which we call volumetric efficiency. Now, volumetric efficiency we shall define in a minute, but let us quickly understand what is it all about. What happens is the density of the fresh charge uh, affects the volumetric efficiency and we have seen in aircraft engine, we need to hike this density through the process of supercharging and then the pressure and the atmosphere, uh, the temperature of the uh, outgoing burnt gas which has remained or the residual amount and then of course, how quickly or how efficiently the intake and the exhaust valves or manifolds as they are often called open and close. Okay. So, the closing of the exhaust and the timing of the exhaust and the intake manifolds is of great importance and this is where the mechanical engineering comes in a big way. So, the engine needs to be designed to create very efficient intake and exhaust manifolds, uh, otherwise it will affect the volumetric efficiency and the timing of the open and opening and closing of these valves. Uh, these, this is the engineering that needs to be engineered into the uh, this particular uh, piston cylinder arrangement, otherwise it will affect the volumetric efficiency uh, and this needs to be made su sufficient attention by the piston designers. Uh, otherwise, the volumetric efficiency as it is defined now would be uh, coming into the picture and it is simply defined as the, the charge that is coming in or the charge that is now available by the theoretical charge which we assume to have uh, to be effective in the cylinder. So, the ratio of the two is the volumetric efficiency. So, the actual charge is the mass that is uh, you know theoretically estimated from the geometry of the cylinder and the total number of cylinders etcetera which we often quoted as I mentioned earlier as the engine capacity and as we see now quite often that theoretical capacity may not actually be effective or operational during the operation of the engine due to the various factors that we have just mentioned. So, the actual operation of the engine would get affected by the volumetric efficiency of the engine which is typically uh, less than 100 percent. The various uh, power that is created is affected by the various losses that occur. We mentioned one of the losses that is the friction losses due to the motion of the piston. There are other losses which we need to contend with and they all affect the final uh, power supply of the engine. One of the losses is due to the cooling of the cylinder body. Now, you see the cylinder is getting heated, we are burning fuel, the cylinder is getting heated, the piston is getting heated and they get heated to very high temperature in spite of the advancement of the material uh, uh, science and metallurgy, the, the heat bearing capacity of these um, metal bodies has certain limitations and if you have to provide them with certain amount of lifespan or working, which is often in terms of thousands of operational hours, then it is necessary that these bodies are cooled on a continuous basis to lend them a certain respectable amount of uh, life. As a result of which a goodly amount of heat is actually lost through the cylinder body through the process of cooling. This cooling is absolutely essential for the life of the engine, but 
it affects the continuous uh, uh, operation of the engine in terms of its uh, actual power supply efficiency. So, a good amount of cooling losses actually take place and as we see in this particular simple graph, uh, as the engine speed increases from low to high, the cooling losses actually uh, stay more or less of the same order. Okay? The friction losses keep on increasing as the motion of the piston becomes faster and faster, the friction losses are more and that is of course, easy to understand this is the mechanical friction. And the other important loss is due to the radiation of the uh, various uh, heat that is produced within the cylinder uh, due to the exhaust uh, which the gas is going out and it, it, it takes away a lot of heat with it. So, the exhaust gas when it is exhausted or forced out of the cylinder goes away with a lot of heat. So, that loss of heat the radiation losses and many other losses such uh, heat related losses put together amount to a large amount of losses. Certain amount of losses are due to the improper inlet and exhaust valve operation. So, when you put all of these are the mechanical functions of the engine and when you put all of them together we find that the useful work actually is a small amount uh, a little more than uh, uh, 25 percent of the energy that is produced through the burning of the fuel. So, only 25 percent of the energy is finally, probably available as useful uh, work and it goes down a little with the speed of the operation of the engine. Uh, so, typically one can say at high speed uh, you can get uh, uh, work done total amount of work, but the efficiency of the work done is likely to be somewhat of the lower uh, order. Now, this is a penalty that you have to pay in an aircraft engine, because you do want high work, high amount of work supply and as a result you are consigned to or you have to content uh, to be content with the fact that you may have to be uh, working at a slightly lower efficiency, because the friction losses and other losses are somewhat on the higher side at high speed operation. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is we have talked about ideal cycle and real cycle. One of the main difference between ideal cycle and real cycle is that the ideal cycle is actually operating on air cycle, whereas the real cycle is operating on a gas cycle. Inside the cylinder fuel has been burned, gas has been created and actual operation of the cycle is especially from point 4 to point 5 and through the exhaust, it is not air it is a uh, uh, gas uh, combination of air and burnt fuel. So, what we have from f 4 downwards uh, 4 to 5 and then on to 6 is actually gas. So, this part of the cycle is definitely gas cycle and that is why that is one of the main reasons you see there is a big difference between the ideal cycle which is given from D to E and the gas cycle gas process from 4 to 5 and they are on, on to 6. So, this difference is mainly due to the fact that you do not have air uh, and as we know uh, and we can quote the numbers now that for air the specific heat ratio given by K in some books it is given as gamma uh, is often is of the order of 1.4 whereas for the gas it is 1.33 and when you factor them in your uh, some dynamic cycle calculations you will find there is a big difference between these two use of these two values in the uh, power calculation or pressure ratio calculation and as a result of which there is a big difference between these two areas it is due to the simple fact that you do not have air here what you have here is gas. Let us look at some of the issues of the engine as a whole. What happens when an aircraft engine is a piston engine is performing for powering an aircraft. As we can see here, the air consumption per cycle, you know, that is given uh, over here as a y axis, and that goes up with the speed. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, the air consumption per unit, uh, uh, air consumption per cycle goes up and it reaches a peak somewhere over here and it goes down. 
whereas the air consumption per unit time per unit second or minute it actually continues to go up over here and it reaches a peak at a very high speed so there is a difference between the air consumption per cycle and the air consumption per unit time the air consumption per cycle peaks at a somewhat lower speed not at the highest speed and then it actually starts going down with increase of speed of operation whereas the air consumption per unit time actually goes up till the a very high speed and then plateaus up and as a result of which ihp the indicated horsepower actually keeps going up and reaches the high value at high speed on the other hand the torque created peaks with the uh, air consumption per charge consumption per cycle and it's approximately around may not be exactly at the same engine speed but somewhere around and as a result of which the high torque is often created at somewhat lower speed not exactly at high speed but high power is created at high speed now this is a dichotomy which most engines have to live with that high torque creation which is important for operation of the propeller and high power supply which is also important for creation of the thrust uh, are at two different speeds quite often two very different speeds and as a result of which the engine operation needs to be properly configured or matched with the propeller operation uh, we shall discuss about some of these later on again in this course the maximum torque uh, of the engine occurs as we now see at a somewhat lower speed um, uh, and the ihp keeps going up as we have seen in the last uh, uh, graph whereas the bhp which uh, takes into account now the fhp actually keeps uh, going up and then somewhere over here the high fhp forces the bhp to uh, level off and uh, it sort of plateaus out and bhp uh, may not increase any further after a certain uh, engine speed so every engine has a high speed at which bhp reaches its peak and there is no point operating the engine above that so quite often most engine speeds are cut off slightly above this high speed and it, it does not operate anywhere uh, higher than those speeds and this is found out from this uh, engine estimation uh, before the engine is actually installed. If we look at BS, BSFC we have seen is one of the most important uh, parameters of the engine operation. It is indicative of the efficiency of the engine. However, in this graph we see that BSFC and the total fuel consumption are two slightly different issues. BSFC is a uh, unit uh, fuel consumption per unit mass flow or unit power consumption and is indicative of the efficiency and it reaches uh, some kind of a low plateau somewhere in, in the speed range over here in this particular engine that is being shown. Uh, it reaches a low value over here at a lower speeds it has actually a higher BSFC at high speeds again it starts going up and BSFC is no more the lowest. So, engine operation in this uh, range of speed would probably give a low BSFC that is true of most of or almost all kinds of IC engines or piston engines even in automobile engines that run the cars or vehicles on ground and uh, you know car manufacturers or operators would tell you that car operation at certain uh, median value of uh, speed of rotation often produces the best efficiency of fuel consumption. On the other hand, if you take the total fuel consumption and we are talking about full throttle operation, it continues to increase with the speed. So, higher the speed of operation, higher is the fuel consumption. Uh, so, we have to balance between the two. We, all, we have also seen that higher the engine speed, higher the power production. Uh, so, there is always a balancing act that the operator has to uh, uh, find out between high power consumption, high power creation uh, which produces uh, which obviously has f high fuel consumption. On the other hand, the BSFC also starts going up. So, if you keep an eye on the efficiency of the engine, 
then you would probably like to operate somewhere at a slightly lower values of uh, engine speed. And we have seen that at the some one of these lower values, you also get a high torque. So, high torque, BSFC, fuel consumption, power production are four different parameters and engine operators have to keep an eye of all of them while operating the engine to find the best balance uh, during the various course of operation of the engine. So, we see now that maximum torque operates at some speed, maximum power operates at another speed, Mac minimum BSFC happens at a third speed. So, we have three different speeds and this is true of most of the engines, all kinds of engines that IC engines that power the aircraft uh, power plant. And this is what an engine operator will have to quickly uh, figure out and apply his engine control to operate. Uh, typically, uh, he would like to uh, do it in such a manner that taken over the en entire aircraft flight, let us say from takeoff to, to cruise to landing, the finally the total fuel consumption would be uh, at a low value. So, this is something which requires a certain amount of control which requires certain amount of uh, uh, engine control, propeller control, some of which a little bit of which we might discuss later on in this course. And, and the two controls together, we will have to find a balance of using the engine for maximum torque or maximum BHP or minimum BSFC, so that the total fuel efficiency of the engine is quite good and competitive and has an economic uh, uh, repercussion in the operation of the power plant. So, these are the issues that typically an engine operator, an engineer would have to deal with uh, in the operation of the engine for flying an aircraft. In file flying of an aircraft engine, one of the things that is required is once the engine takes off, it has to climb to a cruise. And the engine typically needs to provide certain amount of extra power not only for cruising, for climbing and this is how the measure of the extra power needs to be quickly arrived at. So, that when an aircraft takes off and then it finally reaches a cruise where the power available and the power required are matched. So, typically cruise would be somewhere here actually a little before this and uh, we shall uh, talk about that uh, again later on. Uh, how the matching of the aircraft and uh, uh, engine is done. Uh, this excess power availability from the engine is vitally important because this is what makes the aircraft climb. Otherwise, the aircraft would not be able to climb from low altitude to high altitude to the cruise altitude. So, this uh, excess power requirement needs to be factored into the engine design and this is vitally important for aircraft engines. We have in this lecture, we have uh, now looked at various aspects of um, engine that goes into the aircraft. In the next lecture, we shall see various issues that goes into the uh, operational reasons for loss of engine power. We shall see what happens when the engine operates at part load, which is when the engine is not at its full uh, uh, BHP. A full power creating capacity, but at some kind of a part power creating capacity and what happens during those operations. And we shall see that for an aircraft engine, for it to operate at high altitudes, it is necessary we have a supercharging which creates augmentation of power. Without supercharging, we cannot have an aircraft engine. So, this is these are important issues specifically with reference to aircraft engines and these are the things we shall discuss in the next class.